Acids and bases, that'll be the topic of this lesson. In this lesson specifically, I'll introduce you to acids and bases from an organic chemistry perspective. Uh, and in the second lesson, we'll learn how to rank acids and bases. What are the molecular characteristics that allow you to rank acids and bases? Now, this is part of my new organic chemistry playlist, and I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a video. All right, so acids and bases here. So this should be, uh, at least the beginning of this lesson, a little bit of review from Gen Chem, and then we'll just take it further than you ever wanted to back in Gen Chem here in this organic chemistry slant. So first, just a reminder of a couple definitions. So don't worry about that Arrhenius definition you, were, uh, you, know, you learned in Gen Chem, but the Bronsted, Lowry, and the Lewis are gonna you know, play a, a pivotal role in understanding organic chemistry throughout your two semesters. So this is a super important chapter. So it really kind of gives you a basis for understanding chemical reactivity. So you really want to pay particular attention and really get this lesson down, uh, uh, this whole chapter of lessons down in particular. So uh, just a reminder about some definitions. So acids and bases. So Bronson and Lowry, they looked at acid-base reactions as all about following that hydrogen. And they looked at it as an acid as an H plus donor. Let's get that in there. And they looked at bases as the H plus acceptor. And so they looked at a typical acid-base reaction. They said, follow the H that's being given and received. And that's the one I've highlighted in red here. And so in this case, this H is being transferred over to this oxygen so that he ends up with it. And so by that line of reasoning, we would call the molecule on the reactant side here that's donating that H plus, so the acid. And the one receiving it would be the base. But we typically look at these reactions as reversible, and so you should be able to identify an acid and a base on either side of the reaction. So if we looked at the reverse reaction, so this would be the molecule donating the H+, plus, so he'd be the acid, and the other the base. Cool, so you definitely want to be able to identify Bronsted Lowry acid bases. So but Lewis is a really important definition as well. Now, in, in this chapter, we'll probably look at Bronsted Lowry a lot more than Lewis, but you'll find out as far as chemical reactions are concerned, we're gonna look at Lewis acids and bases a lot throughout these two semesters as part of the mechanisms for how reactions work. So, but Lewis's definition here, so he said, oh, you're following the H plus, you should really be following the electrons. Unfortunately, the electrons are a little more challenging to follow, which is why uh, his definition is a little more challenging for looking at traditional acid-base reactions. So, but definitely one you should know. And he said, instead of acids being your H plus donor, they're really your electron acceptors. And your bases, instead of being the H plus acceptors, they're really the electron donors. And so, the way he really looked at this is he said, don't focus on the H specifically, but focus on where that new bond is being created. Where's the new bond? And so if we highlight the new bond that was formed in this reaction in blue, there's the new bond right there. And the question is, where did those two electrons come from to create that bond? Well, if we look, oxygen used to have three lone pairs. Now oxygen's only got two. This oxygen used one of his lone pairs to bond to that hydrogen. So I'm gonna highlight that lone pair real quick, make myself a little room and highlight it in blue. And so that's how Mr. Lewis would have looked at this. He would have said, follow the electrons that are being used to create the new bond. So in this case, you'll learn that we often draw arrows to show where bonds are being broken and formed and stuff like this. And this is the arrow we draw. Now it's not the only arrow because while we make a bond to hydrogen, hydrogen can only have one bond, the old one is broken. And these two electrons end up on this oxygen, which is why he ends up with three lone pairs, even though he only started out with two. But the electrons being used to make the new bond, those two right there. And Lewis would say, ah, that's your base. He's the electron pair donor used to make a new bond. And th th the molecule that had the atom he made a bond to was this molecule, and that makes him the electron pair acceptor. He's the acid. That's the way Mr. Lewis looked at it. So again, for any acid-base reaction, you can always uh, look at it under Lewis's definition, it turns out. Now, to be a Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction, it means that the atom you're bonding to has to be a hydrogen. However, if, if our base bonded to any other atom besides hydrogen, we'll find out bonds to carbon are really common in organic chemistry, and then you could classify it as a Lewis acid-base reaction, but you could not 
not classified as a bronsted lowry acid base reaction. So, but this chapter specifically, we will be focusing on reactions that are both bronsted lowry and Lewis acid base reactions uh, for the most part. In future chapters, we'll see some that are only going to be classified as Lewis acid base reactions. Okay, so now that we got our definitions out of the way, we got to talk about how we look at the strengths of acid base reactions. And usually we look at how far they dissociate in water. We'll typically look at a, a you know, standard reaction here, and this is what you would have seen in Gen Chem as well. And then we'll write the equilibrium constant for this, and we'll call it Ka. And in this case, it would equal H3O plus, synonymous with H plus, times A minus all over HA. So, and the greater extent an acid dissociates, we say it's a stronger acid. And the more it dissociates, the more products you'll get, bigger numerator, smaller denominator, and so you'll get a bigger Ka. And so what you're supposed to take away with you here is that a larger Ka value means you have a stronger acid. So, and that was probably the most common numerical value we used in general chemistry to rank the relative acidities of a variety of compounds. Higher Ka, stronger acid. But in organic chemistry, much more commonly than the Ka, we are going to use the negative log of the Ka, the pKa. And because it's the negative log, as Ka goes up, it turns pKa goes down, just the same way that pH goes down as H plus concentration goes up. And so to get a stronger acid, we're looking for a lower pKa, and this will be the much more common way, at least numerically, that we'd compare different acids. We'd be comparing pKa's rather than Ka's. And you'll find I've given you a bunch of different pKa's. It's on your study guide here as well. And, uh, but a bunch of different pKa's for different functional groups in organic chemistry that you're going to want to pretty much memorize, as we'll see in a little bit here. So, but we'll use pKa's way more often than Ka's. I still think you should know what a Ka is. I still think you should know that a higher Ka means a stronger acid. But again, in organic chemistry, we're going to use that pKa a whole lot more often. Now, it also stands to reason that we can talk with bases about KBs and pKBs, and a higher KB means a stronger base, just like a higher Ka meant a stronger acid. And a lower pKB means a stronger base as well, just like a lower pKa meant a stronger acid. But we'll use Ka's and pKa's a lot more often than we'll use KBs and pKBs. One other relationship we want to focus on is the relationship between an acid and its conjugate base. So, and there's this inverse relationship. The stronger one is, the weaker the other is. So if this acid wants to dissociate more, that's gonna mean it's a, a stronger acid. So, and what it dissociates into would therefore have to be a weaker base because it's not dissociating back as much, so to speak. So the stronger an acid, the weaker its conjugate base, which means if an acid has a lower pKa, that means its conjugate B, base would have a higher pKb if you were comparing two acids in their conjugate bases. So that's kind of uh, one of the lessons you wanna take home. And one other thing that's really important is typically a stronger acid, again, has a weaker conjugate base. And another way to look at it is it has a more stable conjugate base. And this is a really important point because ranking acids can actually be a little bit challenging. We're going to learn a whole bunch of rules for ranking bases. And so most of the time, we got rules for ranking bases. If you want to rank acids, what you're often going to do is actually look at the conjugate bases instead and rank those and know that the acids have the exact opposite ranking because the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. And most of the time to evaluate the, how, how weak that conjugate base is, we'll be looking at stability. And generally the, the principle here is that the more stable the base, the weaker the base. And so we'll learn how to kind of rank relative stabilities of a variety of different structural elements in organic compounds. All right, so I said you're going to want to me simply memorize a variety of different pKa's and as well as the, the structural elements and the names of these different functional groups. Now, some of these you would have memorized from the last chapter. We went through functional groups and stuff like that, but a couple of these will be new, like sulfonic acid at the top of the list. This is a super duper strong and not so common uh, organic acid. Normally, most of the time when we say organic acid, we mean carboxylic acid, but sulfonic acids, these are right up there in strength. So notice the pKa is negative seven, not just seven, but negative seven. It's super low pKa. So on par with some of the strong acids you learned back in general chemistry, like H2SO4, things of that sort. So after that, we've got a carboxylic acid with a pKa in the four to five range. This might include like acetic acid, which is in vinegar. So a typical carboxylic acid in the range of four to five. So this is a phenol when you've got a hydroxyl group on a benzene ring. So, and its pKa is 10. So 
After that, we've got a quaternary ammonium ion, or simply quaternary amine is the way I've labeled it here, and it's pKa is in the 10 to 11 range. So then we've got water, and I just want to put water. Obviously, water is not an organic compound, but I want to put there as, as a benchmark, because a water is very similar in structure to an alcohol, where just one of the hydrogens is replaced with a carbon chain. And as a result, their pKa's are very similar. So water's at 15.7, and a typical alcohol, usually right around 16. Cool, this is a terminal alkyne, and it's a, a alkyne meaning a carbon-carbon triple bond, and terminal meaning it's at the end of a molecule. And when the end of a molecule ends with a carbon-carbon triple bond, you'll see a hydrogen at that end as well. And its pKa for that hydrogen is right around 26. So much higher pKa, way less acidic than like water or an alcohol. And finally, we'll just do ammonia here, and this could just be an amine as well, like a primary or secondary amine, but we usually think of amines as bases, and, but here I'm actually looking at the amine as an acid, and it's just not a great acid. Its pKa is super high, way up in the ballpark of like 38. Cool, and these are the various functional groups that you want to commit to memory, because in a little bit we're going to go through a bunch of rules for recognizing different structural elements. But usually before I ever look at those rules, I usually just go through the list of functional groups I'm supposed to know the pKa's for, and just see if my comparison involves any from this list. Because there's no perfect set of rules for ranking acids and bases, there just isn't. There's gonna be exceptions to every set of rules. And if you've memorized these, and used these first, and the rules second, you'll never get fooled by any one of those exceptions. All right, the last thing I wanna cover in this lesson is when you look at a typical acid-base reaction according to Bronsted-Lowry's definition, you also can often figure out if it's gonna favor the reactants or the products. And so the idea is that the weaker acid and base are gonna be favored at equilibrium. And so in this case, you can compare the two acids or you can compare the two bases, but you're always gonna have the stronger acid and base on one side and the weaker acid and base on the opposite side, and you've gotta figure that out. And in this case, I'm gonna compare the two acids. And I'm gonna do that because I can recognize where they fall functional group wise. So this right here is a carboxylic acid, and I can see that its pKa is in the four to five range. So, and then this guy over here is a typical alcohol, and I can see that his pKa is right around 16. And that's gonna help me figure out, okay, who's the stronger acid? Well, lower pKa, stronger acid. At equilibrium, it's always the more stable and weaker reagents that are favored at equilibrium. So that'd be the weaker acid here and the weaker base here. Notice they're always on the same side together. If this is the stronger acid, then that's gotta be the weaker conjugate base. And if that's the weaker acid, then that's gotta be the stronger conjugate base. And so the stronger acid and base are on this side, the weaker acid and base are on this side. And at equilibrium, those weaker ones are always favored. So we could redraw this arrow here to show that this equilibrium is gonna heavily favor the products. The bigger the difference in these pKa's, the more it's going to favor whichever side you're favoring, in this case, the products. <clears throat> We'll look at another one here. So, and in this case, if we follow the H and play that game with Bronsted and Lowry here, I drew it in red to make it easier to follow. And so the one, the species donating the H is our acid. So, and the one receiving it is our base. Cool, and on the other side then, that makes this the conjugate base of our acid, and this one the conjugate acid of our base. And once again, we can compare the two bases or the two acids. And again, conveniently, since I've memorized all these lovely pKa's, I'll compare the two acids. And I've got a phenol here, and a phenol's got a pKa right around 10. And again, I've got a carboxylic acid with a pKa usually in the range of four to five. And now I can see that the stronger acid is actually on the product side. And if this is the stronger acid, then that's gonna be the stronger base. They're always on the same side together. And at equilibrium, once again, the weaker acid and weaker base are actually favored. So this equilibrium, if we redraw it, is actually gonna favor the reactants. We'll have more reactants present at equilibrium than products in this acid-base reaction. Now, cool, so here I've done it from the pKa values we've memorized. In the future, we might actually be doing it by actually some of the rules we learned for ranking bases. And so you might actually be comparing the bases instead of the acids. Now, again, sometimes they'll give you pKa's for doing this. Sometimes they expect you to have memorized pKa's for this, but most of the time we'll start using rules for this. And again, you just have to be able to rank acids and bases, whether it by, be by pKa's or the rules we're about to learn, but you have to remember that it is always the weaker acid and base that are favored at equilibrium. Equilibrium. Now, if you benefited from this lesson, would you consider giving me a like and a share? The most helpful things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems on acids and bases or the study guides that go with this lesson, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.